Howdy, y'all. Alan Alford here, and what you are about to hear is a live recording. I recorded three shows in a row live at Zero Trust World 2024 in Orlando, Florida. Now, Zero Trust World is sponsored by Threat Locker, and Threat Locker, before you hear the show, has this little bit to offer you. ThreatLocker recognizes that cybersecurity starts at the endpoint and has built a zero-trust endpoint protection platform that strengthens your cyber defenses from the ground up. ThreatLocker application allow listing, ring fencing, and network control offer seamless cybersecurity for organizations in any industry. With ThreatLocker in your cybersecurity arsenal, you can sleep better at night knowing that known and unknown software, application exploits, and even network traffic can all be blocked by default. If you're looking for a proactive solution that will keep your business better protected in the face of cyber threats, check out ThreatLocker by visiting ThreatLocker.com and tell them that you heard about them down here at the ranch. Howdy, y'all. It is Alan Alford here live at Zero Trust World in Orlando, Florida, put on by our good friends at ThreatLocker. This is a heck of a conference. I have been interviewing folks and running around and talking to people and all the hacker uh, workshops and the pineapple cracking and all the good, fun stuff. But one of the highlights of the conference for me was uh, Dr. Chase Cunningham. I'm sure you guys know who he is. Gave a brilliant talk about the uh, the five horsemen of the apocalypse as it relates to cybersecurity. And I thought I'd ask Dr. Cunningham to join us on the show. So thank you, sir, yeah. for coming on down to the ranch. Yeah, thanks for uh, you know showing up out here. It's always good to run into another person from the motherland. So right, you know, got to we're in Florida. We got to you know bring Texan people around when we can. Exactly. You know, and I left my cowboy hat. I left it on the bed. I completely forgot to bring. Oh, it. oh branding. I, branding I, normally, I normally fly the colors, right? <laughs> so all right. So you you gave this brilliant presentation, and you talked about the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and we talked about pestilence and famine and war and death. Uh, and then we talked about cyber as a uh, as a as a horseman. So, um, you know, we don't want to do the entire, you know, talk <laughs> you already all went through it again. once. You, yeah. you already, well, you already did it once. You've been through it once. But I thought we could do some highlights. So I guess first and foremost is, you know, what you presented was a picture of kind of an economic reality as well as a global, you know, I guess we'll call it a socioeconomic reality in terms of your pestilence and famine. You know, can you give us a quick summary kind of, of like the foundations and the backdrop of why we're even talking about these things while we talk about cyber. Yeah, because all this st uh, stemmed from a conversation I was having when I was working with some folks on draft legislation on Capitol Hill around cyber, and they kind of blew it off. They were like, we don't really understand what the implications of this. And one one staffer basically said that this is not a, a global issue, like this is something the U.S. can handle. And I, I was pretty much taken aback with that. Um, I was like, well, you're the, you're the people writing the legislation and you think that this is just kind of a bunch of nerds that are, you know, amping up and doing into the world talk or whatever. So that prompted me to go off and do my own research to look and go, how can I ground people in the reality of cyber is the ultimate leveling of the playing field? Yeah. And these other macroeconomic and demographic problems are going to feed into the need for cyber to be what is leveraged so that the playing field becomes level. Yeah. Cyber, cyber security has democratized warfare. Yeah, it Bo has. Bottom line, bottom line. Um, uh, it used to be a terrorist needed a dirty bomb. Mm -hmm. Now a terrorist just needs a, a ransomware event, and, and they're off to the races. We tried to put together, and we, um, I, outside of this podcast and this podcast life, I'm a co-producer on a baseball documentary uh, way back when. That's so cool. Um, and the producer, the, the main producer on that one, good friend of mine from college, you know, I, I helped out. It was really his baby. He and I decided to do a podcast on the Lazarus Group. And we wanted to get deep dive into who they are, what they do, what they did, and get folks in the U.S. government to talk about what they are and what they did. I couldn't get anyone who would, how do I put it? If they were informed, they wouldn't go on the record. On the and record. if they weren't informed, they would. And mm -hmm. so we ended up abandoning the project. And that floored me because what we're talking about here is, is a group of hackers who are generating nuclear missiles. I mean, that's, I mean, if you want to sh cut to the chase, you know, hack up front missiles on the back end, that's exactly what's taking place. So walk me through this kind of this global landscape. I mean, we're in agreement here on this democratization thing. Um, this is some frightening stuff. And, and I want to understand the bigger picture landscape and, and the fact that you're talking to our government and they don't seem to get it. That's a little scary. Yeah. Um, What's the big picture? What is the message you're trying to get across to folks about all this? Right. So if, if we look at the global problems, right, and, I, and I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm not a right-wing or left-wing person. Like, I'm just a, a realist. I look at data, and I basically figure out that 
what it, what it is. And if we yeah. if we consider that there are resources that we have globally because of climate change and a whole bunch of other factors are becoming more scarce, uh, things like water, things like food, the fact that everyone's economy is still in the tank and it's getting worse in China and other areas, means eventually all these organizations, all these nations are going to have to figure out how do we either grow and get back to where we were or how do I take something from someone else and use it for my own purposes? Right. And cyber is the ultimate way to do that where you have plausible deniability and you can have maximum impact. And we saw it in Estonia. We saw it in Ukraine. We saw it last week in the AT&T thing. Yeah. I think that that was China testing us out to get ready for the election. Um, And we didn't do well. So this, all of this stuff plays in and, unless you've been living under a rock, it's not hard to look around and go, there's legitimate giant problems that if we don't start dealing with it, someone's going to act. Full agreement, full agreement. Um, and it, you know, it could be anybody, right? I mean, the, you know, you, you look at the, the levels of influence, you know, in terms of the geopol- geopolitical relationships and you've got Russia talking to Libya, talking to, you know, on and on and on the trickle down thing. Any one of those points up and down that trickle-down relationship, it could be this nation is backing this one that's backing this one that's backing this one that's against the U.S., right? It could be this five-tiered model. It doesn't matter. Any one nation-state actor from any one of those five tiers can do the doing. It could be the big guy funding it all or the little guy on the on the front lines. It doesn't matter. Well, and I mean, I wasn't joking during my presentation when I showed the, the guy from North Korea who's been uh, outed and— Basically, his crypto mining hacking that he was doing has funded the North Korean nuclear program yeah. to the tune of nearly a billion dollars. Yeah. And I mean, that's a country where it is so poor, their people eat grass. Yeah. However, they have nukes. Yeah. And it's been from cyber that they've been able to fund that. Yeah, exactly. It's exactly. just as mind boggling that in, in the in the history of conflict and the history of warfare, the only two things that have ever just unequivocally changed the game was the invention of gunpowder and cyber. Yeah. I, I would agree with that. Gunpowder leveled the playing field, uh, enabled, um, you know, if you look at the Battle of Creasy, I'm geeking out here. Uh, this was this was the Normans and the Saxons. This was way back when. And the English longbowmen uh, defeated uh, a mercenary army of crossbowmen uh, for no reason other than the crossbow strings got wet in the rain. They couldn't take them off easily, and the English longbowmen would curl their strings under their hats and wear them under their hats and restring when they got to the battlefield. That kind of minor technical difference making the whole difference on a battlefield scenario and then you invent gunpowder and now we can do it from much further away and and suddenly nations that have nothing more than sulfur and charcoal lying around are are empowered right um this is a whole different ball game though this is this is icbms i mean this is I mean, this is is the ability to impact global economic interactions. This is the way that you can degrade services. And uh, and it's uh, for all the folks that I work with on Capitol Hill, they've most of them have paid attention to kind of the Chinese doctrine and the Russian doctrine or whatever. But what I remind them all the time is there's paragraphs in there where they say that chaos is just as good as victory. Yeah. And that's what concerns me more because it's not a a uh, substantial sort of process and program or whatever, it works through proxies, it works through other agents, and mm-hmm. all you have to do is scare people enough yeah. that they start tearing themselves apart. Right, right. And something as simple as the entire cellular network going down or critical infrastructure, you know, electric for the entire eastern half of the U.S. goes down. I mean, there's a million and one non-destructive necessarily, but very chaotic uh, events that, that would that would trigger a cascade failure. I mean, look at what happened with COVID, Right. Um, this wasn't just a, a, a pandemic that went ripping through the country and the world. Now look at something like uh, critical infrastructure, cascade failure in the eastern seaboard. We're from Texas. We had two years ago in February the complete shutdown the of freeze. the Texas grid. Yeah. Right? The, great, <laughs> the great Texas freeze shut us down. Um, this was a disturbing event. I was literally to the point where I was looking at what furniture I could chop up to burn in the fireplace. Right. Um, you know, zero to chaos is real fast. It it's, is. it's only a couple of paychecks away for most Americans, and it's uh, it's a thing. Um, <laughs> it's a thing. So chaos is easy to sow um, and definitely has the effects on your enemy that you want. If, if, if it is an enemy and it is chaos, you're indeed sowing on purpose. Like, that strategy works. I mean, and we're seeing it all, already, I think, in, in the escalation of things going on. And it, it's going to be, uh, for the uninitiated, what you will see over the court, especially because this is an election year and it's already chaotic. Yeah. You're going to see these minor things that are going to keep kind of coming in and playing around or whatever else. Personally, I really think that it's going to stack up really heavily, probably in late September, early October. Uh-huh. And 
it's going to be full bore by the time the election comes around. Yeah. Um, just because everyone's going to be looking the other way. Right. And right. what's also crazy to me, and I talked with the folks on Capitol Hill about this, I said, let me pose a scenario. If if a bunch of Chinese C-130s flew over um, Missouri yeah. and paratroopers jumped out and they locked down the hospital, would that be an act of war? Like, what would the U.S. do about that? And they said, well, that's, that's unacceptable. That's infringement on our soil. Right. Well, I was like, that's what's happening with cyber. Right. There's people who can't get medical service right. because it's been locked down and it's yep. coming from a government affiliate. Yep. yep. So why are we treating this much different? It doesn't make a lick of sense to me. Yep. And I think attribution is probably the number one reason for that. Is yeah, we all puff totally. and posture, but you don't really know what time it was. So who do you who do you lob the nukes at if you don't know who's cybering you? Um, and who do you cyber back at if you don't know who's cybering you? Right. Well, and a lot of these affiliate groups that are in you know kind of tangential areas that are doing things, whatever else, like put a couple of the uh, the CIA Ginsu missiles through the building. Yeah. And they'll change their tune because yeah. then it becomes it becomes physical and kinetic. But right. we can't sanction our way through this stuff. We can't no. send people nasty grams. Like there has to be a uh, if you do this, expect an actual response. Yeah. Well, we just uh, quote unquote shut down. Um Oh, they're back already. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I love when somebody which, says shut down like I, I was about to say bit locker. <laughs> yeah. Um Oh, it was Lockbit. Uh, Lockbit. Yeah. <laughs> BitLocker. Yeah, the hard drive encryption guys. Yeah. Uh, no, Lockbit. Uh, we quote unquote shut them down, and they're already back in business. Uh, and this was this big celebrated international, you know, all the nations coming together to bust this one set of bad guys. And, and they got a couple of dudes in Ukraine, and they Kumbaya shut down some and servers. Ra, ra, yeah. yeah. And they're right back in business already again. And even if it's not nation state, the amount of money to be made off this stuff is so lucrative. I think I think in your talk you said uh, average salary on planet Earth is 14k. Yeah, if you do the math and you go through globally annually what people make, whatever, and it, there's some there's always some variance in there, but it comes out to about fourteen thousand dollars a year yeah. per person. And the average ransomware fellow is making more like like seven hundred k, eight hundred k. Yeah, yeah, that's a bit of a difference. There's some incentive there for sure. I mean, we saw it in Somalia with the pirates, right? Mm-hmm. Like when I was in the Navy and we were doing counter piracy stuff, it was not hard to figure out who the pirate lords were because yeah. they were driving escalades and they had nice houses and then everybody else was you know trying to uh take over ships but it was because they were making two three million dollars on, a, on right. a deal with an insurance company right right and right. the little guys figure out real quick well that's a better way to do it so why am i doing why am right. i out here like farming dirt when i can right. be doing that right it's a much more lucrative income stream and there it is there's already a model of its success even so nation state sponsored bad guys cybering us um you said in your talk it's a bridge to kinetic and mm-hmm. and i think that's that's truly it i mean and it's 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 as black and white and concrete as lazarus group is funding nuclear missiles in north korea period end of discussion we know this um but it's also precursor right i'm sitting here thinking of what the russians did to ukraine before they went in uh there were some cyber attacks to sort of warm up and soften the target before the kinetic warfare began and there's that aspect of it too i mean at this point it seems to me that Cyber warfare is warfare. Oh, for sure. Like, and it, I mean, you you see the the escalation of conflict. It, if you actually took like the build up to kinetic conflict and mapped it out on a, a plot, and you also took what's occurred with cyber to map it out to the next kinetic incursion, they're just parallel. I mean, it's the same yeah. thing that happens. You know, you don't just invade. That does that doesn't yeah. work well. Yeah. Like, there's a build up and whatever else, and then there's all these like little strategic things that occur, and yep. it's the same stuff in cyber. They're just doing it digitally. Yep. And I remember way back before Cyber Command, when when we had a defensive capability is what we always talked about, and then we finally admitted, no, 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 we have an offensive capability. Yeah, no kidding. We all do. Everyone on this planet has an offensive capability. And there's and no Geneva Conventions it. in cyber. There are none. <laughs> um, Everyone is after everybody. Everyone's after everybody and doing whatever they can do to whoever they feel like they need to do it to. And this is just this is just the state of modern life now. I mean, this is this is life on planet Earth. Nation states are, are literally at cyber war with one another, aggressively pursuing whatever ends they, they feel like they need to pursue versus whoever they've determined to be the enemy. Um, and the sowing chaos piece, you know, to your point, philosophically, like obviously destruction we all know is valid. You know, theft and making boatloads of loot we know is valid. The chaos model, yeah, there's a couple of entities on the planet that have outright stated, like chaos is, is as good an end as any. I don't know that we're all doing that, Um but beyond theft and beyond destruction and beyond chaos, I'm, I'm wondering what other 
what other paradigms are there that are driving cyber warfare? I mean, I think really it, it boils down to the economic factors, and that's why I made sure to point out for the folks that were in the room, like, look, there's some things you should know about the way stuff has worked in these other nation states. There's, I wouldn't call it a valid reason, but there yeah. are economic reasons that they're engaging in this type of stuff, and it's because they're painted into a corner economically. Yeah. yeah. And unfortunately, the reality of conflict and war is it's good for business. Yes, so yes. That is where you begin to gain back some of your GDP, industries, yep. innovation. I mean, you know, all kinds of things happen because of war. Absolutely. And when you run out of options, that's what you're left with. Yep. We and wouldn't have computers if it wasn't for war. We wouldn't, we wouldn't have, have motorcycle helmets. We wouldn't have internet if it wasn't for war. Right? We wouldn't have all these things we rely on and, and treat as par for the course, you know, all came out of World War II, essentially. Uh, the difference engine and everything else that was going on, Bletchley Park and all of that good stuff. Um it, it, it seems to me the last big economic boom, I mean, truly big nationwide boom was post-World War II. Mm -hmm. That was the biggest spike we had seen in quite some time, and I don't know that we've seen a spike that big since. No, it's been bumpity bump since then. Um, we, we did okay after uh, basically when the Russians collapsed in Afghanistan. That was The Cold War was a really big bump for economies. Uh, and, but now, I mean, if you look at just the way the numbers are playing out, and, and interestingly enough, in the U.S., because of our own issues with inflation and the little value of the dollar, like, that is something that, at the very highest levels of our government, they're realizing, like, well, we probably need to do something here, too. Yeah. And that's a different story. That's a very different story. And it's, it's you know, I don't think there's a nation on the planet that doesn't understand the warfare equals economic boom model. You go through the first cycle where it's not a boom. But eventually you build up whole new industries, you build up whole new technologies, you get the post-war boom. Like, it's 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 science. I mean, it's it's every economist can walk you through this curve. It's it's a known fact, right? Yeah, so, the GDP so, grows. I think that the numbers that stay are about 3 to 7% following a, uh, a conflict operation. That's and crazy. if you think 3 to 7, like, inflation typically is 2%. Right. So even if you hit 3, you're still better than inflation by 1%. Right, right, right. And if you hit 7, you're on easy street. And if all the nations know this, if all the nations know that cyber is a brilliant precursor to, bridge to, uh, surrogate for kinetic, and we all know that kinetic warfare pays off, uh, it's amazing that we haven't already blown up into World War III already, honestly. Uh, and I'm wondering what, what the next big, you know, geopolitical trigger is going to be, but I, I well, and it the other one, scary to me. The variable in this that I didn't talk about that I, I, I will in, in future stuff is Let's take away the big players. Let's take away China and Russia and the U.S., whatever. Yep. There are lots of smaller nation states in here that have eh, pretty legitimate capabilities. that could do a lot of the same things. Right. For me, they are the ultimate variable because they might accidentally start conflict by just engaging in some of these things that they're not well-suited for or well-prepared right. for. Right. I mean, you could trigger uh, conflict just based on taking something down. Like if somebody from... Um, I don't know, just pick a random country, uh, I don't know, Uruguay goes after like a dam in the United States and causes some sort of actual failure and people die. Yeah. All of a sudden we change it. But they could launch those attacks from servers in China. Right. And we would never know it was Uruguay. Um, I was just thinking of the um, Stuxnet mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. NotPetya and some of these. NotPetya was aimed at a highly specific language. I forget which language. Literally, if you took apart the binary and looked for what it was looking for, it was looking for strings of... Uh, I believe it was Latvian. Yeah, I think it was Latvian, something yeah. crazy like that. They were basically looking for users of a specific financial management software that had this specific language enabled, and it was supposed to target just this one target, and then bam, it's yeah. a worldwide phenomenon, right? <laughs> it got out. It got out, and, and it was targeting more than what it was aimed to do. So... Just like quality control for the good guys is an issue, um, you know, stringent quality control on the bad guy track, are they really investing the effort and the energy to make darn sure it targets only what they want to target, or do they just not care? I mean, there's no incentive to quality control that and make sure you're only hitting the target you want. In fact, that's chaff in the wind. I mean, there's no incentive, like we were saying, because you're, uh, you're not afraid of the actual physical response like the odds of us even arresting someone yeah are so slim yeah i mean it's crazy when you hear about uh ross ulbricht and the uh the the, the uh, silk road stuff they did yeah they had to have a guy dos his wi-fi they had to have an fbi dude in the truck they had to have another dude across from him they had to have somebody with a camera over the top recording keystrokes yeah, yeah. i mean that's for one guy yeah 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 and, and that's one guy they managed to find thanks to a flaw in the, in the <laughs> tour system in the first place right 
if 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 a it's, flaw yeah right right <laughs> a flaw flaw a flaw flaw um but but the point is you know the flaws aren't always there the back doors aren't always there there's plenty of non-attribution methods that are still valid still stand and i don't care whose supercomputer you're using you're never going to figure out who actually pulled the trigger yeah and i do think that just because it's this conversation that comes up all the time too is the quantum conversation because i i almost included that in this talk and i didn't want to get into the quantum thing right. but uh, here's one thing that most people don't understand about quantum. Let's say that China has been collecting data because they want to do this quantum break thing they're talking about. Right. The real issue that we have with quantum, and most folks don't know this, is actually the cooling. Yeah. Because to run those machines long enough to do a quantum computation requires crazy levels of cooling. Okay. And right now, we literally can't do it enough to actually have them be valid to output the type of data you'd be looking for. Right. Now, if you hear that there's been a crack in the ability to do quantum cooling, that's when I get concerned. Right. The compute stuff, yeah, we're pretty much there. Yeah. But the cooling side is to make it to make it practical and usable over time. Then it is Katie bar the door. Right, 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 right. Yeah, that's that's interesting. And I got to say, like, uh, you know, you say it's already there. I was at RSA. Jeez Louise, this would have been two or three RSAs ago now. And I'm walking down the you know the startup alley on the edge of the mm -hmm. floor. You know, I always like to go see who the coolest. Oh, I love the startups. Were. Yeah. And uh, one of them had a banner that said quantum computing. And directly across the hall was when they said post quantum computing. <laughs> <laughs> and I stood there and got a snapshot of both banners in the frame. And uh, yeah, I'm like, what is post quantum when we don't even have quantum actually working yet? Like, well, I think Apple said they have post quantum for uh, iMessage now. And it's like, um, okay. Yeah. I guess. <laughs> right. Sure. Right. All right. Little, little tangent, little sidetrack there. <laughs> so at, at the end of the day, um, warfare has changed. Um, the landscape of inter. You know, inter-country conflict has changed. The alliances are shifting. Weird things are happening. Um, there's, you know, there's there's advocates of, of doing away with NATO, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we used to have this kind of predictable landscape in the Cold War. Like, it sucked. You know, I grew up, you grew up during the Cold War. Like, yep. we, we knew all about the, you know, our parents had the whole duck and cover thing going on. And, yep. and, and Your you school know. desk was going to protect you from a nuclear strike somehow. Right. Of course, of course. <laughs> And, you know, we grew up with that fear. Like, I mean, I remember truly, like, having the fear as a kid that, oh, the, yeah. that the bombs are going to fly, uh -huh. right? Yeah. And yet, at the same time, there was a defined set of boundaries for what the world looked like. In other words, we had NATO. We had we had the Soviet bloc. You know, like, we knew who the players were. There weren't shifting allegiances. Whether the bombs actually fell or not was a, was a physical decision that we all knew somebody had to make. Um it was contained, even though it didn't feel that way, versus today. It doesn't feel contained at all. No. And, I mean, it, the motivations at the global macroeconomic demographic levels for that just, like, screw it, we're just going to go forward and see what happens type of approach, yeah. that wasn't there before. Now it is. I th and the other one, too, that was that I learned about doing this research was the demographic issues that we're facing. Uh, and that's every country on the planet. Yeah. Um, and that, that's a really interesting one because you're running out of people. Yep. Like you're, everybody thinks, oh, we have 8 billion people on the planet. It's overpopulated where else. Yeah. Right now it is. But yeah. look at what's coming around 2100 yep. and those types. It's Japan is shrinking. Mm -hmm. Um, they, they've, they've, they've made a very loud statement about we're shrinking and we got to do something about it. They're, they're so insular and yet they're not breeding. Yeah. Um, they're shrinking. Um, Overall, your stats showed that for the whole nation, that's the case, or for the whole world, that's the case. Yeah, we, overall, typically we need about two, two and a two point one, basically uh, babies per family to keep right. growing. We're at about one point four. Yeah. So overall, the world is not reproducing. And you know, I, I I never thought in my wildest dreams I would actually have a slide about sperm count during a cybersecurity thing. Right. But I was interested when I found the data. Right. Right. That's one of the that's one of the variables as well. There's a lot of reasons reproduction isn't happening. Part mm -hmm. of it is the economic baseline you established. Right. People are like, I don't want to I can't afford kids. I can't afford kids. How am I going to, uh -huh. you know, my, my kids, my oldest is 21 and he's still living at the house because he's like, I can't move yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah. Our oldest uh, similar story. Um, it's tough. It's tough out there uh, in all economies. And, and this is the land of the free, the home of the brave and the land of opportunity. And we're even seeing it, you know. Their generation is struggling to make minimum wage add up to I can live someplace. Well, and I mean, even playing down that rabbit hole, too, how long is it going to take for those people that are our own American citizens to go, like, I should just be a ransomware operator? I should just flip the bit and go bad. And uh, as soon as I do, I'll make 800 k a year. That's, uh, yeah. I can move out of my parents' house. <laughs> yep. And you can do it from mom and dad's basement and route through Uruguay and route through China and off you are to the races. And the odds of you getting arrested are 
super slim unless yep. you screw it up. And it all started with the uh, anonymity of payments with cryptocurrency, right? Which sucked because when cryptocurrency first came out, like I read uh, Necronomicon mm-hmm. or, or, or uh, Cryptonomicon. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, which uh, is a Neil Stevenson novel all about all about the history of encryption through World War II, all the way up to a modern group of individuals that were working on basically what at the time was cryptocurrency. Just it wasn't called that back then sort of the progenitors of that. It turns out that was based on some real stories. I actually know some guys that were like some of the characters in that book, it turns out. Um, but the whole premise there was it was this like cool hacker vision that cryptocurrency was going to level the playing field and let individuals play the same way nation states play and protect their own wealth and not be taxed and da 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 And it turned out to be like the single biggest sword we could hand the bad guys. Yeah, it's nice to have your money be untraceable. Yeah. And I mean... You know, there's oh, well, we can get some back, sure, but when you're talking about the large expanse, like it's uh, it's a it's a drop in the bucket of what's been traded and used. And I mean, yep. all you got to do is go look at what's going on over in North Korea to see right. living proof. Yep, all kinds of shiny new missiles. Uh, yeah. And I love your comment on stage about, uh, you know, you might as well slap a sticker on there. This is courtesy of you know so and so latest <laughs> ransomware victim. Like this missile brought to you by. Yeah, exactly. Pfizer or uh, yeah. AT&T or right. whatever. And I mean, it's what's weird, too. And I mean, I know you're you've got other things to do, but like the the folks that I continue to have these conversations with about about like zero trust is not a thing or whatever else. I now I get to the point where I ask them, I'm like, what else you got? Right. You've tried everything else and it's failed. Right. Doesn't it make sense to at least engage in a conversation about the strategic value of what we're talking about here? Uh, absolutely. And officially the topic of this show is zero trust, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> We've so, gone down some so rabbit Chase, holes. So. so Chase and I agreed we were going to cover, but that's that's exactly it. I, I, you and I are two of the folks that believe zero trust is real, zero trust is attainable, and, and zero trust is mandatory. There are so many of us in our circle that don't believe at least some of those things and maybe don't believe all those things um you'll still hear from CISOs. oh it's nothing more than a marketing buzzword i want to scream every time someone <laughs> says that um you know real zero trust is all about i don't care who you are or what you are or how cool you were the last time i saw you i don't trust you i mean it's not hard if somebody shows up at your front door do you just let them move in right you know? Even if it's a friend, you check and make sure it really is that friend, right? You don't just randomly open the door when someone bangs on the door and says it's the police. Like, you look through the peephole and make sure it's really the police, right? Um, Rudimentary stuff. This is all about validating identity. This is all about segregating access from resources. This is about protecting binaries. This is about protecting humans. This is about protecting networks. This is about distrusting absolutely every facet of anything that might get to the assets you care about. Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny, too, because when you look at, like, everybody relies on the CISOs love the Lockheed Martin kill chain. If you take the inverse of the kill chain and you apply ZT to it, it's it's that's it. It's like, yeah. there you go. Like, what else What else do you need? If this is what you guys in a closed room are talking about is your methodology for the attacker lifecycle, whatever, Right. if I disrupt all the stages of that, wouldn't that be legit? Right, right. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. Zero trust, I, I, I think, is the only it, – it's – it's all we've got at this point. It truly is. And, I mean, uh, to the doubters or whatever, I say continue doing what you're doing because we do need slow gazelles. I need people that will slow down <laughs> the adversary. You know. Yeah, let the cheetah take you if down. If you choose I'll be over to here trip trusting. in front of the zombie horde, then that sucks for you, but I'm going to keep on going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't have to have. Uh, you don't have to be faster than the bear. You just have to be faster than your buddy. Um, that old joke. But, that's no, that's exactly it. It's, it's not a joke. Um, it's very real. Um, you're either zero trusting or you're a riper target. It's that simple. I mean, it, it, how much proof do you need? That's what. That's what's funny to me when I talk to people is they go, "Oh, this, that, that," and I'm like, "You have 30 years of proof that the other model doesn't work." Right. Right. More than 30 years. And we, you're we unwilling. Were trying the other model in the mainframe era. We got 50, uh, 60 years of it. You know what? You know what's really crazy is you know when the first time the remote race model of security failed huh. was the fall of Troy. There you go. And that was a long time ago. Right, right, right. What did we used to call malware? Trojan horses. And why was that? Because it came in Troy. I mean, yes. look <laughs> good. Let's bring it in the gates. Oh, no, it contains bad things. Yeah. I mean, how much proof do you need? That's exactly it. So, all right, huge champions of zero trust. There you have it. Me, Dr. Chase Cunningham, loving the zero trust world and metaphor and model, embracing it and seeing it as the biggest defense against all these horrible things we just talked about. <laughs> yeah. The apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. The four horsemen coming your way to a theater near you. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, Chase, thanks so much for coming out. No, thanks for having me, man. I, I love uh, I love the stuff you do, and uh, we us Texas folk always, you know, got to get together. I appreciate it. Take care.